everyone, my name is Yule and you are watching New Multiculturals Community Hour. In this segment, we are talking about civic issues in Winnipeg, Manitoba. According to a recent national report, Manitoba continues to have the highest child poverty rate among all provinces in Canada, with a percentage of 20.68. This rate is 7.21% higher than the national average. This implies that over 64,000 children in Manitoba are living in poverty. Why Manitoba remains the unfavorable province when it comes to child poverty, and what actions our community must take to create better outcomes for children living in poverty. Today we discuss these and other questions with Michael Redhead Champagne. He is a public speaker, writer, community advocate, and educator. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for coming to U Multicultural Studio. We are pleased to have you here. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for the great work all of you do here. I want to pass you this small present from our team. Please take it. Ooh. It's, uh, tobacco. it's tobacco? Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Tobacco is a super meaningful thing uh, from the knowledge that I know yeah. from uh, First Nations uh, folks, uh, many of them in this territory. Um, a lot of the teachers that I've had around tobacco tell me that tobacco is uh, about, you know, gratitude. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's about that exchange yeah. of knowledge. Uh, so we of hope knowledge. you will share so thank with you. us. Thank you so much. So we hope you will share with us your knowledge and your expertise. So of let's course. start with the key question. Uh, why is Manitoba once again the province with the highest rate of child poverty in Canada? Manitoba is once again the province with the highest rate of child poverty in Canada because we have a lack of serious work happening in terms of supporting children and families in this province. Mm -hmm. um, all we have to do is look to the Child and Family Services system to see the thousands and thousands of children that are in our child welfare system to see right now that we are having a problem in the province of Manitoba with caring for children in a meaningful way. And so it's quite frustrating um, to see how this is progressing. Um, and when reports come out that say Manitoba continues to struggle with the rates of child poverty, child and family poverty, it's important I think for, for a lot of us when we talk about child poverty to ensure that we're extrapolating that idea to the family as well. Mm -hmm. Children don't exist in isolation. They didn't just pop onto the earth all by themselves. They have families that need to be cared for as well so that we can provide the appropriate prevention and intervention supports so that all kids in Manitoba don't have to go to bed hungry and have their basic needs met. In order to address child poverty, we need to understand the contributing factors. So in your opinion, what are the main cause of child poverty in our community? I think the main cause of child poverty in our community is unfortunately apathy. Mm -hmm. the, the solutions for how we address and can solve child poverty are not complicated and they are not new. And if I were to list off all the things that we need to end child poverty right now, I'm confident that you and the listeners, nobody would be surprised. And so what do we need to do to end child poverty is we need to start applying an equity lens to the work that we're doing. And when we're talking about equity, that means applying the most attention and resources to the people in the most dire situations mm -hmm. and in the most need. And so while it's admirable, and I think a lot of folks like it, that our current provincial government has a tendency to issue one-time financial uh, payments that go to everyone, regardless of income, mm -hmm. I think that if we were to apply an equity lens to some of the resource distribution that happens in the province, we could make sure that those with less have the most resources. What is the long-term and uh, short-term consequences of child poverty? What would be with our community if the government will continue this approach? Well, I think we're seeing it right now in numbers like the folks that are struggling with homelessness in Winnipeg. We see from the most recent Winnipeg Street Census that the most average age that folks experience homelessness in Winnipeg is at age 18. 18. And uh, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anyone why it's age 18 that folks first experience homelessness in Winnipeg. Unfortunately, many of those 
are folks that are aging out of the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. And so Manitoba is getting real good at orange t-shirts and hashtags that say every child matters. But what I'd love to see them getting good at is providing for the basic needs of children in Manitoba, not just here in Winnipeg as well, like across Manitoba. There have been states of emergency called across Northern First Nations in Manitoba just this year. And mm -hmm. recently as I think two weeks ago from this moment of when we're recording. Okay. And with those states of emergency being called, have our lives as citizens of Winnipeg changed at all? Have we redirected our attention even for a moment to the communities that are crying and screaming and declaring states of emergency? I don't think we are. And one of the things that I hope can happen as we move into the future, not just looking to levels of government to take action and to push for solutions and, and share resources, but looking to everyday people like yourself mm -hmm. um, and the people that are watching here today yeah. to say, I believe in you and the conversation we're having here today. And when you say, is there anything that I can do or what do we need? Yeah. I believe that you and the folks listening are going to take the necessary steps, even though we're not you know, in a fancy role or we don't have a, a formal title, we still have a circle of influence. And each of us are able, I think, to do a little something, something to support parents and families and children. So one tangible thing I'd like to think that I'd like to put out as a call out for everyone mm -hmm. is volunteer one hour a week. Just Isn't one. That That's like now? one and a half Netflix episodes. <laughs> right? Sacrifice yeah, yeah. those episodes and volunteer one hour a week to support families that are working to bring their children home in Winnipeg. There are oh, you know, nearly 10,000 children that are in care right now in Manitoba and those children have families and those families are working as hard as they can and doing the best that they can to ensure that they have the necessary education, employment, housing, food resources, and access to basic needs so that they can provide for those children in a good way. But do you know what every parent and caregiver working to bring their kids home would totally appreciate? Mm -hmm. A little bit of help, a little bit of support. Bit of it doesn't take a lot. Um, if everyone in Manitoba were to volunteer one hour a week, that's like lots of hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When did your journey as a volunteer start and why it is important for you to tackle the problem with child poverty in our community? My journey to fight poverty began as a child, whether I do it or mm. not, uh, as a child living in poverty. So coming from the north end of Winnipeg and having family from Shimadawa First Nations, these are two communities where poverty is a big deal and it impacts the well-being and the livelihood of those communities. I see it in the north end of Winnipeg in the folks that get involved in crime at an early age trying to just provide for their basic needs. Um, I see it in Shimadawa through the states of emergency talking about why are so many of our young people hopeless and attempting to take their own life. Mm -hmm. And so there is an element of despair that I see in both of these communities that accompanies poverty. And so it's frustrating for me that year after year, we get more new reports that tell us shocking things, like poverty is bad, and when children go to bed hungry, not good. And so <laughs> I get frustrated when we have to repeat ourselves. And something that I've taken recently to constantly repeating is this. Why do people in poverty and people with lived experience have to repeat themselves to death because it is only when somebody dies from these circumstances that media, government, and systems tend to take notice. And so how many more people have to die? Mm -hmm. How many more children have to go hungry before these systems and the citizens of Manitoba will take action? I hope the answer is zero. So you managed to address poverty in your life. What would be your message to people who are struggling now? A lot of folks will say education is the way out of poverty, and I really have to agree with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. um, except I have to broaden the understanding of what education is. I think a lot of people think education is graduating from grade 12, going on to university, 
getting some degrees, mm -hmm. etc. But to me, I think education, my, I call myself a street educator. And I call myself a street educator because I'd rather educate people in a park, uh, yeah. at a protest, uh, in a field, in a casual environment, than in a formal curriculum-based environment. Because as a street educator, I get to see folks willingly choose to learn or willingly choose to engage with people that are different from them or hear from perspectives and stories that are different from theirs. And I feel like there's a powerful learning that happens when someone is intrinsically motivated to go and find that learning for themselves versus the you have to mm. type of learning. And so I love being a street educator. And so I really think that if we do empower different helpers and folks that have a little bit of extra time a little bit of extra knowledge, a little bit of extra resources to share, like I said, just maybe one hour a week with folks that need a little bit of help, I think we can take a big dent out of child poverty. However, what was the original question you asked? Like, what can we do oh, about child poverty? No, no. What, um, I'm just like, what go, I'm just going. <laughs> uh, what would be your message for people who are struggling right now? Uh, my message for people that are struggling in poverty right now is that there is a way out and knowledge is the way out. And what I was trying to get to before I got into my rant is that it doesn't just have to be formal education. You learn education when you volunteer in the community. Mm -hmm. Volunteers are sure, they're giving their time and their help to somebody else, but what is that volunteer taking away? Right, they've listened probably to some stories. Mm -hmm. They've seen probably some things and hopefully those things make a meaningful impact on individuals to be able to take away and change the way that they engage in leadership, whether that's just being a leader in our families or that's being a leader at formal levels, uh, at different system tables, wherever we may find ourselves. So what I would say in closing to people that are experiencing poverty right now is let's take every available opportunity mm -hmm. to make change. Say yes to that committee, say yes to that job opportunity, say yes to the things that are being offered to us. And if in the future you're not able to fit in there, that's okay. I bet you you know other people with lived experience or in poverty or in your family or friend group or in your circle that would also be interested in participating and just swap them out. So say yes to everything, but know that it doesn't have to be you doing everything. We can ask for help. And learning to ask for help is really, really powerful. It's a really powerful thing that we can learn. But I think why I've become such a system advocate is because I know a lot of folks in poverty do ask for help and yeah. they don't get what they need. So what I do a lot in my work today is banging on doors inside of systems that already exist and saying, how can we get the resources that folks need to them today? And at the same time, hopefully, how can we make adjustments or changes in these systems so that we can either prevent poverty uh, in the future or at the very least prevent the barrier that prevents folks from getting their basic needs met. Mm -hmm. Take that barrier down. Yeah. So you mentioned that you were a street educator. On your opinion, on your uh, experience, now public became more interested in this question and they're more engaged. Yeah. I would say 100%. People are beginning to understand that there's a connection between poverty and crime. Oh, yes. Or there's a connection yes. between poverty and homelessness. And now I hope what we're talking about today is making that connection between poverty and child welfare. And also poverty and lack of health care, like health in general, right? So if folks don't have, if they're not healthy, if they're not safe, they're going to have to educate themselves and find alternative employment, which some people call crime, mm -hmm. to be able to meet their own basic needs. And then unfortunately we see, you know, disproportionately, it's folks in poverty that are harmed by the justice system. And we can't ignore that there's racial components to that as well. Indigenous people make up 80%, 90% on some days, 100% of the folks that are in the remand center or the provincial justice institutions. And we don't make up 80, 90, 100% of the population of this province. Right. And so when those types of statistics are just floating out there in the world and everyone is going on about their day, 
business as usual, ho-hum status quo, it makes me a little bit nervous about how am I going to activate the helpers that we need to change these systems. A lot of children and a lot of youth live in poverty, but these children, this youth are our future Winnipeg. How it is important to invest in these people, how it is important for government to understand, to realize that we need to support these people. It is essential. It is essential that different levels of government begin working more collaboratively with one another to provide the supports, the targeted supports, strategically to the folks that need it most. I think that if we just had more cooperation across these different levels of government, we would get there. And I always like to highlight some of the good things that I see happening as well. Shout out to the City of Winnipeg Poverty Reduction Team because mm -hmm. they have an implementation plan and I'm a part of a community working group that oversees that implementation plan. Thank you City of Winnipeg for your leadership in taking poverty seriously enough to measure it. Right? If right. we're going to measure Absolutely. it, that's a starting point. See that province of Manitoba? See that? See what they did there? You can do it too. <laughs> See that government of Canada? See how we're monitoring implementation of poverty resources and, and initiatives? You can do it too. I believe if Winnipeg can do it, ain't nobody else got no other excuse. So uh, Heather at the province and Justin at Canada, pay attention to what's happening with Scott and uh, Winnipeg here. Yeah. You know, that's another thing I think that's really important for people to think about. Um, these different levels of government feel like they're so far away. Um, the so city, they even don't start the province. Like yeah, the, the, the government of Canada. So what I always like to do is educate folks a little bit and try to make it a little more cash. And so I know we're supposed to say his honor, or no, his worship, Mayor Gillingham. I think that's the fancy way to say it. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's Scott. That's Mayor Scott. What's up, Scott? That's Scott from Winnipeg, right? You know, I know Heather Stephenson, we're supposed to call her a formal name as the Premier, right? Premier Stephenson. Well, she's also a person. Mm -hmm. That's Heather from Manitoba, right? And then yeah. we have our, our Prime Minister, Justin. Justin from Canada, right? I know he's the, uh, the right honorable Prime Minister Justin Trudeau of Canada. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, there's a, there's a way for us to address, there's a time and place for us to honor and support those formal roles. I think that when we're educating people about jurisdiction and what different uh, groups are responsible for, personalizing it as I just have is a good way for people to remember. In your opinion, does Winnipeg have enough resources to prevent child poverty? Yes, Winnipeg does have enough resources to prevent child poverty, but we're just allocating our resources poorly right now. When we overfund, particular parts of the budget. We don't have enough resources for any of the prevention initiatives, like all the stuff that the community services and recreation branch is doing. When we spend all of our money on policing, which is a reactionary style of spending mm -hmm. and a reactionary thing we're funding, there are no resources left for preventing that kind of stuff. So if we're always stuck just reacting and chasing after the bad thing, the crime, obviously we're going to continue coming back to the table and saying, oh, we need more money for chasing after the crime. Because that's where all of our measurements are. That's wh where all of our attention is. But if we were to take even a fraction of that policing budget and reinvest it in the things that have been defunded over the years, like community centers have been defunded, libraries have been defunded, 24-7 safe spaces that, you know, some exist, some did exist, some don't exist anymore. They could be funded from the city of Winnipeg. And so I would just hope that folks like Scott Gillingham and people at municipal levels would be able to listen seriously to some of the things that the poverty implementation folks are doing and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. Because saying we don't got the resources is a bunch of baloney and you know, there's a lot of people that have done the math to demonstrate that. So, Scott? <laughs> Do you believe if we prevent child poverty, we can also solve the problem with the crime? 
If we address child poverty in a meaningful way, not only would we reduce the crime, we would reduce the amount of people experiencing homelessness, we would reduce the amount of people experiencing despair, not getting access to what they need from our healthcare system, and we would reduce the number of, what was the first one I said? Homeless? Yeah, kids in care is the next one. We would reduce the number of kids in child welfare. So I think there's an extremely logical reason and backed up in data reasons for us to be investing in preventing poverty because then we would have much stronger positive outcomes and all the things that we look at like social determinants of health. Um, we would make sure that folks are fed, housed, and healthy. And if those things happen, they don't got to commit the crime and we don't have to spend 330 plus million dollars per year on policing in Winnipeg. It's a dream. Radical, I know. How much time <laughs> do we need to address child poverty? Do you think it's possible to stop or at least um, reduce it? And how far are we from achieving this dream? How much time do we need? Well, it just, I think when I think of that question, I want anybody who's listening to think about the kids in their life. How long does that kid need to eat? How long would you wait to feed that child? That's how long you should wait to solve child poverty, because that's what we're trying to do here, feed the children. And so I bet you a bunch of people listening just got super uncomfortable with that question, and I hope that they did, because there are hungry children in our city and province right now. And if we don't do something about it, mm -hmm. if we don't push the decision makers, if we don't educate one another, if we don't take action and volunteer ourselves, then those children and those families are going to feel like they're fighting an uphill battle against poverty by themselves. And I think that it's the hopelessness that comes from being in poverty that I really try to fight in the work that I do in the community. I try to bring people together. I try to break down silos because I want folks to feel a connection to one another, um, regardless of where their background is. The good thing about poverty, the silver lining to poverty, whoa, what am I saying? Is folks have now a shared experience, whether you're an indigenous person who comes from a northern, Man northern Manitoba and is a product of the child welfare system like myself, mm -hmm. or whether you're somebody who's new to Canada. Um, and I think that that experience ties Unfortunately, indigenous, racialized, and you know, ev everybody um, who has experienced poverty together, it ties us in. There's no way for us to unentwine ourselves. And what I love about that is that creates a commonality that we can then move forward on. Because we can all agree poverty sucks. And if we can all agree that poverty sucks, then I bet you we can all agree on what the solution just might be. And I know for me, I'm all about that education. That's why I like libraries, community centers, and recreation so much, because that's the places that we learn. Education and knowledge is great, but we also need to uh, put these things on practice, not just to knowledge, right? Yes, I'm so glad that you said that, because I've been focusing so much on individuals, because I want the people listening to feel empowered. But there are things that the government can do. Let's not forget that during uh, the pandemic, everyone agreed that it was an emergency. So when they mm -hmm. agreed that the pandemic was an emergency, all of a sudden this little thing called CERB came to exist. Canada Emergency Response Benefit. What that meant was they were basically giving people a universal basic income. Now I know a lot of people just react strongly to universal basic income because they're like, what do you mean? You're just giving people money? Like, how will anybody work? How will anything work? Rah, 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 rah. Well, guess what? We gave people money during COVID-19 and the world didn't end. And so what did happen though, what almost ended during COVID-19 and those financial benefits being distributed, child poverty. Was reduced. It was reduced to the lowest point in Canadian recorded history. Mm -hmm. In Winnipeg or Canada, across Canada? Across Canada. That's true, Winnipeg, Manitoba, and Canada. And for that to happen, and for us now to go back to pre-pandemic ways of thinking, as if we didn't just see the most successful pilot project Canada has ever experienced happen, seems wild to me. 
-hmm. it, is, it is wild that we would just ignore such a successful pilot project and such a successful example of ensuring that children have the things that they need. It is actually irresponsible of us to ignore the success of this pilot project. If we spent the resources, documented it as we have, we should take the lessons that we learned about the flexibility of systems, the way resources were allocated, the way jurisdictions cooperated in COVID, when we agreed there was an emergency, and all those same people should still agree today that children living in poverty is an emergency too. Because yeah. I think you think that. I think I think that. And I bet you a bunch of the people watching think that too. But if only our systems thought children in poverty was an emergency, then we could move things around and do what we got to do, as we did with CERB in COVID. But we don't have an emergency now, and government don't want to. And that's my frustration, yeah. because there are literal states of emergency in the province of Manitoba that have been called in recent weeks. And I bet you by the time this is posted online, there will be more. I don't know how to move systems. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to move governments, mm -hmm. but I only know how to move people, which is why so much of the work that I'm talking about is saying, what can we do as individuals? Because I think that, I think individuals and people can create new systems. We can create new systems when the systems that are no longer serving us are broken. Why not? I don't got time investing in broken ass systems that hurt children and reinforce poverty. And I'm also not interested in reducing poverty, right? Language is important. Poverty reduction initiatives exist everywhere. I want poverty elimination. Mm -hmm. I want poverty alleviation. I want to end poverty. And for me, that's the goal that I'm working towards. I don't want a little bit less poverty tomorrow. I want it gone, all of it. And if that means whole systems got to go, I guess that means we better get building to replace those broken systems with good ones that are equitable and loving. What would be your message for people who are want to volunteer their time? What would be first steps for them? Where do they can start? Um, in the province of Manitoba, I would recommend that you start with the Campaign 2000 report. Mm -hmm. So there's a Campaign 2000 report. It lives on the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg's website. Uh, it was released I think earlier this year 2023 and in it there is a bunch of chapters that have been written uh, one of the one that I contributed to was one that talks about the importance of supporting young people as they age out of care um, but there's tons and tons of numbers in there there are breakdowns of organizations that are doing great work so what I'd like folks to do if you don't know what your first step could be would be to take a look at that report and then start doing a bit of extra research on the organizations that were a part of that report to see if any of those organizations resonate with your beliefs. Because mm -hmm. then you can just go and help the people that resonate with your beliefs and, and what your heart is telling you. Thank you so much, Michael. We're going to conclude our conversation. Thank you for sharing your knowledge, your expertise. I believe that your work, your knowledge make a positive impact in our community. Thanks again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything. And thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope you enjoy it. If you like this episode, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to see our upcoming episodes.